some like sample uh, tight turn stuff that we would do. Um, so I, I always have in between drills. Um, it's like kind of my secret sauce, but there's always a drill we do for two minutes in between other drills that repeats throughout the practice. So it's just a great way to get a ton of reps. Um, and so an example here, and I had video and for some reason it wouldn't upload today. You just had to do a figure eight with a partner. So if you can visualize, um, you know, if Tim and I are partners, I'm holding up fingers for Tim to see and call out while he does tight turns, kind of like a bow tie in front of me. So horizontally in front of me, he's doing tight turns. So not away from me, but an eight kind of out in front of me. So every time he turns, he's got to call out either numbers on my hand or stick up or stick down. We would do that the first break in between drills. So say after we do this, um, just the tight turn progression, I'd have them do the figure eight uh, with no puck. And they're just calling out those numbers. So every time they turn the corner, they're looking over their shoulder and they're trying to call the number as early as possible. The next time we do the drill, they'd be doing it with a puck, which you are probably would not be surprised how quickly their ability to call the numbers out goes down. And then the final progression would be with passing. So they would be um, not calling out numbers anymore, but they'd be passing with that person and trying to give good targets. So again, just an easy way to in between every drill, get a lot of extra skill in. Um, and they know, okay, back to the figure eight. Now we're going to do it this way, this way. And it just recurs throughout the whole practice. So um, just something I've always used, depending on the, the theme of the practice, the in-between drill fits the theme of the practice. So if we were doing a passing practice, they'd all be passing drills. So this retrieval progression, and I apologize, it's a bit small here. Uh, let's make it a bit bigger. So... This is, we wouldn't do all of this in one practice. I just like to put it all on one page. So depending on the team I'm with, I can make it easier or harder. So I always start with open ice retrievals first. Uh, it's less scary for the girls than retrieving a puck off the wall. They're more worried they're going to smash into it or that they won't pick up the puck. So keep in mind, they've already done a ton of tight turns by this time in practice. So we would start with, uh, I call them you go, I go drills. So if Tim and I are partners. I go first, and then when I get back, Tim goes. So you don't need to blow a whistle or anything. I always tell them just get inside the dot line before you turn, so you don't need a cone. Uh, they just know where the dot line is, and then they can go around that. Um, so again, we would just work on a basic weight shift to a tight turn, right? So this might be a little bit of a fake one way, turn the other way. Then they'd send the puck out inside the dot line, fake one way, turn back into it. These would be, these first two progressions we spend a lot of time on, especially if you're trying to add deception. But even on that first practice before I really infused deception, just even getting them to time how to pick up this puck in a tight turn effectively. So the way I teach it, and I'm happy to debate this with anybody, right? I always teach the tight turn as inside, outside crossover. So inside edge, outside edge, crossover. And when they hit their outside edge on the ice, they're trying to punch back in the direction they're going. So as I make this tight turn, let's say I'm uh, punching through with my right foot, I ride my out, uh, inside edge of my left foot, and then I punch my right foot back so my toes point to the boards. That kind of rockets me around the corner, and then I add the crossover at the end. Kim, um, I'd like to interrupt. I'm not disagreeing at all, but in my day, it, it was the reverse, you know, to get that inside leg on the ice because turning, kids have trouble turning one way and getting their weight on the outside edge of the inside leg. So yep. you're saying you're using a, a basically a jump, uh, as they call it, a bit of a jam stop turn. So it's a quicker turn, but you've got to come out of it regardless of which one with that cross under so you can accelerate. Absolutely. And I find it's a great point, Wally. And, and again, this is with um, with my audience, with the girls. Uh, I find a lot of them just haven't been taught how to tight turn properly. So they um, they either do it like they're skiing down a mountain. So their feet are too close or they only use the outside leg like they're turning with one leg on the inside edge. So even that idea of just punching the inside leg through on the outside edge is very foreign to them. And this would come way back when we're working on tight turns earlier in the practice. But I found if they actually lift up that leg and lunge into it, they start to understand the concept better rather than 
keeping both legs on the ice. When they keep both legs on the ice and turn, they tend to like look like they're skiing down a mountain. So Can again, explain that again for my sake. I don't know if everybody understands this. I know. Just describe it. Uh, which foot? You know, would you do that again, Lee? Sure. We so, focused on inside leg ahead before and turning, but go ahead. Sure. So uh, if we look at the drill here, it might help. So as they're skating in towards the middle of the ice, yeah. right, before they've started the turn, they, they load the inside edge of the outside leg, right? So you're still facing the middle of the ice, but you've started to load the turn, right? So you're on the inside edge of the outside leg. Okay. In order to turn the corner and go back towards the wall, they're lifting up and punching that leg through on its outside edge to carve back in the direction they came from. So they've still got the inside edge of the outside leg on the ice. Then they lift up the other foot and punch it back. Again, this is making a really tight turn, okay? Punching them back towards where they came from. So that's the inside edge of outside leg is step one. Step two is outside edge of inside leg. Step three is the crossover. And when I say step one, two, three, like they're happening pretty darn fast. But in the beginning, they actually have to do it slowly and lift up their feet. So whether that's a crossover or cross under, um, you know, we're working on both those edges when they cross out of it. Um, but those are the three steps I'm trying to amplify on the tight turn. And when they pick up the puck here, I'm trying to get them to touch the puck on the second step, which is the outside edge hitting the ice, so that they accelerate back with the puck and the puck pulls them around the corner, right? So the puck leads them back where they want to be. And I apologize, I don't have clear video of this. Um, my video uh, software wasn't working properly this morning. But that's, again, if I'm getting really granular with them, which I try to, I want them to pick up the puck or touch the puck for the first time on the, when the outside edge hits the ice. And my, when I do it that way, they tend to accelerate out of the turn with the puck much more quickly. So again, this would just be um, open ice retrievals. And I ask them, I say, where do you use an open ice retrieval? Where would this happen on the ice? So they have to say, okay, well, maybe on the breakout if it's not against the wall, maybe on the regroup. Uh, when it's just floating around in the neutral zone. It happens all the time, right? But I ask them where they would use this skill. I'm not telling them, you use this skill here. What they usually don't understand is how often it happens in the offensive zone, right? They understand the regroup and the breakout, going back and getting the puck, but they don't necessarily understand going and getting a puck and turning back towards the middle of the ice in the offensive zone. So... Again, the first practice is open ice progressions. So again, I just have some passing here just to, again, the higher level groups, you know, I get them to pass as they're crossing over. So they're on one foot or the other foot. I don't let them take three steps before they make the pass. And then this last progression here, uh, which is sort of more Jim, on the right. Jim, pardon me, when you get the puck, uh, do you talk about the hands? But you're, like I know with a puck, you go into that turn sometimes carrying a puck. Do you go wrist across? No. Or, okay. No, I always go hands away. Uh, lost you again, yeah. We've lost you, Kim. I Why never say I, I never say always. I will say. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I, I never. Sorry, guys. This is going to be fun going back and forth today. You guys can talk when my internet dies. It's fun. <laughs> uh, it's like a water break. No, I wouldn't say never. Um, and, and in this instance, I mean, if you think about the way I've drawn the drill, and I'll throw it back on the screen here in a second, <coughs> crossing your hands over and building a wall might not be the worst, worst thing. If you've got someone right tight on your butt and you're just trying to get away from her, you're not necessarily trying to make a play, um, that, might, that might actually be a great way to keep it tight and build that wall. I would say generally, I want them to keep their hands away. Um, if it's more an open ice, uh, because we want them to be on a position to be able to make a play. Uh, but again, the girls tend to have the chicken wing top hand tight all the time. So even if they're crossing their hands, they've got to get their hands out away from their body. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, it would be more of a focus to have hands away on the, especially on the open ice ones. When they get into the wall, it's harder for them to have that distance on the tight turn. They might just have to have their hands close because they're navigating so close to the wall. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, get to another term. Uh, uh, Morris Lukovic has mentioned this. Uh, your, your hands may be away from the body, but uh, if you bring your hands close, you, you put your hand behind your hip on that turn, it keeps the puck close, and you come out of the turn ready to shoot. So mm -hmm. that's something I just wanted to bring up that... Um, I've been a wrist to cross guy from the Howie Meeker days, short stick theory. It's easy to cross the wrists and do the tight turn and cross over. But now, the and with the longer sticks, I found the hand behind the hip helped them turn better. Uh, no, that's, and I, I often use the cue, like you want your top hand coming out of your back pocket or out of your side pocket. So you want it to be like out there, um, especially on the backhand side. Uh, I'm always talking to players about like uh, not squishing their pillows. So their top, like if they squish their hands in, they're squishing a pillow. So I want them to pretend they have a fluffy pillow between their top hand and their body. And their goal is not to squish that pillow. Um, you know, again, sometimes they have to, but if we're talking about uh, having maximum um, ability to make a play coming out of the turn, uh, we don't want them to be squishing that pillow. So hopefully you guys can see my, can you guys see the practice plan again, Wally? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so just want to go quickly over this open ice retrieval here. So now we'd add back pressure. So they'd have a partner chasing them off the wall. And the first version of back pressure we would do um, is the player behind puts her stick either on the left or the right and makes it blatantly obvious which side she's going to have the stick on. So now the player has to look over her shoulder and make a read, and she's going to... If we're, if we're doing deception, she's going to fake into the stick and turn away from the stick. If we're not using deception, she's just going to find the stick and turn away from the stick. So that's, you know, really where we're adding a little bit more scanning and, and awareness. So we would start that at about 50% and it would be scripted pressure. The player behind just puts her stick clearly one way or the other. And then we would add it um, to be non-scripted pressure where the player behind is just playing it like she normally would, trying to chase that player down. So again, they're not carrying the puck here. They've got a player behind them who's pressuring them. They've got to read where that pressure is coming from and then pick up the puck while under pressure. So that's pretty challenging uh, once you get to the, the point where they have to make that read because they don't already have possession. So adding deception in there, um, you know, again, I would say is a relatively advanced skill that I would use with players later on. Because in the beginning, they're just worried about where the heck is that girl and how am I going to pick up the puck without falling on my face? So um, practice one with this, I would say on the retrieval progression off the wall, we're not, we might get to back pressure. We're probably not doing the little passy ones I have in the middle there. And the back pressure would just be with that simple read of um, the scripted stick. And they... That, to me, if I can get to that before I go into anything resembling a breakout, we already have won the breakout, right? If they understand how to read where a stick is, pick up a loose puck, and accelerate away from that player, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, so here would be a drill that I just use. It starts to look like a breakout. It's not, I don't call it a breakout. So the coach just puts the puck in, and they have to skate it out under pressure. So the second player, again, it might be a scripted stick. Uh, it could be a coach putting pressure on if it's, you know, if the players are a little bit more green. And this player who picks up the puck here, the X, just has to skate it out as fast as she can on her side of the ice. So again, with the girls, they're going to want to go behind the net and run away from contact. Uh, so I make sure they stay on one side of the ice. And what we start to see here is, they're going to turn up ice away from pressure and that player is going to be right there. So now we can start to say, okay, how do we beat her? You haven't beat her with that first turn. Are you going to turn back? So here the tight turns come back in. Are you going to turn back or are you going to drive skate around that player and continue in the direction you're coming from? So I kind of let it happen organically and see how they do just trying to skate it out. And then once I start to see the the four checker, I guess, and I, I don't call her that, but the defender 
being a bit more aggressive and the attacker doesn't get a clean exit, we bring them back in and say, okay, well, you didn't get it out on the first tight turn. What did you do? Oh, I turned back the other way. But what you'll see a lot of them do is they turn into the girl and then they try to like Tommy toe drag her uh, when they turn into her to try to break the pressure instead of turning back away and creating uh, with another tight turn. So again, this drill I would do with as young as U11, probably the U9s, it would just probably happen a little later in the season when they can actually handle a puck and tight turn with more confidence. Um, I also do it uh, with U9s, I do it with a, a ringette a ring to start. Um, so, Kim, Kim yeah. I'd like to mention again because uh, watching Tom practice and the other coach of the Pee 13s, I really appreciate the teaching you're doing. You are a skills expert teacher. The uh, coaches like uh, Tom and Wes may not get into the details of those specific skills. So I've sort of tried to simplify it for the average coach uh, who isn't, you know, doing such specialized detailed work. And I'm looking at your diagram here. The first thing I thought on the diagram is take turn, go to the wall. I'm thinking of breakout. And that's that, that whole idea, the, the checkers chasing you and you're drawing them. Tom Malloy mentioned under pressure in the ozone, as soon as you get the puck, if you shake your head, that's a, a friend of ours did that all the time. That head shake, they bit, you could go the other way. Even if you couldn't tight turn well and cover it in a, you know, technical perfect fashion, the importance of the fake and the tight turn skating out of the turn, I would emphasize. So all I talked to Sam uh, Holmes about last week was just skating around the rink slowly, call for, fake inside, turn outside, go the other way without a puck and then with pucks. Skills between drills because everybody's running conventional drills. And uh, I'm just keep up with these details. They're huge. I'm just saying maybe the average coach with their players can have them skate around and learn about slow fake inside go outside before adding a puck thank you very much kim i wanted to get that in no and that's great wally and and i would say um i i would add the deception usually in the second practice so we would come back to these drills and revisit them when and i always have the three parts of deception right i stick body so we've all seen the stick wave right? That often accompanies the head turning, right? And that can beat people really easily before you get to the puck. I always was amazed how well it worked um, when I was doing it to other people because I didn't even have the puck on my stick, but they still went for it. So weight shift uh, or, you know, a jab step, you know, uh, is sort of a new way of faking as well. Um, so you can add stick, eyes, jab or stick, eyes, weight shift. And you're right, Wally, a lot of players will bite on that. Um, you know, whether it's the defenseman chasing you in the offensive zone on the rebound or whether it's uh, the four checker chasing a defenseman on the breakout. So um, I just don't always start with the deception on the first practice because uh, I just want to get them to amplify tight turning. Um, so. Oh, this. Uh, sorry, I put the wrong version of this in. So see where the X players are, they would actually be up by the coach. Uh, um, I was doing this this way just specifically for a. Uh, a particular coach because I was the only one running the practice. So I was actually feeding pucks in from the middle where the players were. Uh, but typically I would have the players up top. So now we're actually going to call it a breakout and I'm going to still keep them confined to one side of the ice uh, to force them to have to deal with more pressure. So obviously once we open it up to the full zone, it's going to be easier for them. I'd rather they have to solve the problem in a smaller space first. So again, it looks identical really so the way this is set up. So I apologize. I should have drawn it the same way um, up here. But depending on uh, which practice I'm putting this in, there's the one on O skated out, which is identical to this, uh, or the one on one skated out is this drill here. So now this is where I start to get a bit nerdy about it. And this is the way I'm teaching it now with the girls. Um, we're going to add the second player on the breakout. And so you know, we've all taught, you know, open up on the wall or the center is low and slow. I'm trying to just 
kind of break the mold a little bit. So I'm talking to the second player about being a backpack. That's the term I use. We're going to have a backpack player. So the second player in is the backpack. And when you tell a player she's the backpack, you don't have to explain it. She knows she's like right on, right with her teammate, a stick length away. Okay. As one of my players says, she goes, oh, I'll be like COVID away from her. I'm like, I don't love the term, but yes, that is exactly what I want you to be a stick length away from her as she's re- going to retrieve the puck. Now this breaks the mold of a lot of the ways we used to teach breakouts, right? That player is kind of on an Island. Go get the little black thing, Sally. And let's see what you can do with it. So we have a backpack player. That's the second player, second quick. The reason I explain is, well, what if that girl blows a tire? She loses the puck or the pressure player steals it from her. You can't be hanging out on the wall. Can't be floating around in the middle. And again, we're not working this positionally at this point. This isn't D's and forwards and centers. This is just humans going to get a puck off the wall and to skate it out. Kim, I I just want to... It's so applicable. Uh, coaches that work on breakout, they have their forwards standing at the top of the ring at line waiting for the pass to come. Uh, I work with Tom's U16s. We call it the goal line. Your use of backup, a backpack, is perfect. I've always said you may only have to come back to the ring at line. You can get a quick up then. It it. It's it's a matter of figuring out and, and going to the right place, but backpack, quick, close support. I really like that term. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and so I'm putting it in the context of that the breakout player is under pressure because I don't know how many like U13 girls hockey games you've watched recently, Wally, but it's like full pressure all the time. You're never going to see a controlled breakout. It's just like banana hockey. Let's just chase, right? So even if the team's in a one 2 2 there's hard pressure on the person picking up the puck. So, but to your point, Wally, the backpack player's trigger to move is once the puck carrier makes the tight turn. So once your teammate has gained possession, has turned up ice, then the backpack player can engage. So you can imagine on a dump in where your defenseman is going back to get it and you're going hard to be the backpack, but you're still up by the ringette line. If that player turns up ice, you don't need to keep being the backpack because she's now coming up with speed. So that's the trigger. So the backpack player is going in a second quick and she's going to turn and open up once the retriever picks up the puck and is looking up ice with full possession. So now we've solved the problem of, well, there was a girl really tight on me. She didn't really have it. And you've got the center standing at center ice. So what I'm teaching right now is the backpack player has to make a read. She turns the opposite way of the puck carrier. So like you said earlier, Wally, if the puck carrier turns up the wall, the backpack player turns to the middle. If the puck carrier turns to the middle, the backpack player goes the other way. So you've instantly created space, right? And the girls are really hesitant because they they don't think If they're the backpack, they don't think they can, in one turn, create a six to 10 foot pass. They think they're going to be too close to the girl, right? So it takes them a little bit of while to figure it out. I I teach an open pivot in this particular scenario, obviously not a tight turn from the player who's receiving the pass. Um, Although sometimes I would, if there wasn't a lot of pressure. Um, So that instantly, that idea, and it's amazing. I just started teaching it this, this way this year. Even my low level kids who just came out of house league, U15 players. So they never played rep hockey. They probably not done very structured practices. They're now playing U15 B. They pick this up in 10 minutes or less. Being a backpack. I I want to mention something here. Um, The support forward on breakout. And I've done this with Tom with great effect. We, we teach uh, front foot stop. Always face the puck. T start, which opens you up to face the puck. Target with one hand, easier target. So those teaching points, and I may share that when I share this uh, uh, video with the audience. But those little key teaching points 
they're vital to success in the big picture of things. So thank you. No, that's great. And I, you know, I, I watch coaches run breakout drills where like everyone's turning their back on the puck carrier. And then the coach emails me a week later. I'm like, I don't know why we can't break out. I'm like, well, because nobody knows where the puck carrier is and she fell over. So we probably should have kept an eye on her. Um, so again, if this is the first practice plan, I would maybe I would get to two one zero. So the backpack player and the turning away from the way the puck carrier turns, single pass coming out. I might get to the coach applying pressure and the the puck carrier having to make a read of which side this coach's stick is on, and tight turning the other way. So that again, this I don't want to spend thirty minutes on the same drill in practice, but in I would say in about ten minutes. I can get them to understand backpack 2-1-0. And if they get it pretty quick, we're going to throw in coach being really nice with a nice stick position so they have to continue to make that read. Um, and then you've really worked on breakouts, right? I mean, they're making a single pass. You could add a second pass, right? And again, I've, I'm now working up with teams of doing it like with three players in this area, and how we teach the third player is different because she's getting open and being creative. She's not the backpack. Um, but I think if you can solve the two, the first two in, you know, supporting each other and making a little breakout pass, even, you know, I think of Thomas's team playing in the Olympics. I mean, this is how they broke pressure on the breakout all day long, right? I probably didn't call it this, maybe did, I have no idea. But that was how they were ba- breaking out. This is how you break out under hard pressure. So, I don't go now into with them Well, on your breakout when Sally's the center, like we don't do that. I don't do that while I'm there with them. But the feedback from the coaches has been that none of the teams I work with have had any problem breaking out. In fact, they're breaking out extremely easy um, using this. So, and they're not working a ton on breakouts other than when they're working with me. So that's really good feedback for me. It doesn't matter if they can do it in practice. I need to know, is it working in a game? Are you getting stuck in your end? The feedback is they're not getting stuck in their end um, Tim with has using this system. There. Tim, Tim. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Just for just for clarity, Kim. I mean, this is all great. So if if I'm getting this instruction at practice as a backpack player, I, I love I love the analogy. And uh, like you say, if you're coming back in the zone. You're you're hustling to be a backpack versus coast, coasting, standing, and watching. So if we go one step ahead, and you might be getting there, but now if there's a puck retriever, and obviously in a game or in an upcoming drill, there's a checker. Is the backpack player's target to be a backpack on the checker? Because obviously, if she's a backpack on the offensive player, she's going to be right beside the checker almost. So just for clarity, maybe talk through that. Yeah, totally. She's the backpack on the checker, right? So the checker would be in between the two. And then, and, and that's, you know, depending on the, the team, like we might instantly, I might tell the coach, pin, pin the puck carrier. Just go pin her and see what happens, right? And then you instantly have second quick support on the defensive side. Right. So I don't necessarily say, okay, now we're going to teach it on how you defend. But when the breakout breaks down and someone gets pinned, right, the four checker wins, right, all of a sudden we're in perfect support position if we're the backpack player. So that's typically um, what I would use to illustrate it. But no, that's a great point for clarification, Tim. Thank you. So, and obviously, you, the backpacker needs to read how much pressure is the retriever under. Obviously, the the more space between the retriever and the checker, then sort of, um, I guess the sort of the not the less urgency to provide the backpack, but you know you're going to have a better opportunity. The retriever is going to have a better opportunity to to turn up ice versus being worried about, um, like as you say, a, a pin or a contact and a turnover. Where the, where the second quick backpacker is needed, so to speak. Totally, and I and I I always tell them that the trigger is your teammate turning up ice and getting eyeballs up ice because we've all seen the girl who gets it at our blue line and there's no pressure, 
and still skates it all the way behind our net. And she could have just quicked up, upped it, but for whatever reason, she decides to skate it all the way back into our zone, right? So I tell the backpack, once she turns up ice and looks up ice, then you're going to open up. So even if there's no pressure, sometimes that's the read the defenseman makes or the center or whoever's first back makes. So that, that trigger has worked really well. So they don't go too deep and they don't leave too soon. And they have to wait to make that read. Peter Whitney. Peter's got a question. Go ahead. Your mic's off, Peter. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Kim, uh, question for you, because I love the shoulder check. My guys have always tell them, coming in three times, shoulder check before you, you pick up a puck so you have a sense of what's going on. But with your backpack there and the communication piece between those two players, at what point do you teach that backpack player to, because I'm assuming they're doing the same thing, right? They're coming in, they're shoulder checking as well, scanning the situation, being eyes for that puck carrier, telling them, hey, on wall, back to the middle. At what point do you introduce that? Yeah, I would say that is a great point, Peter. And that would be once we've added the pressure and we're just giving, we're trying not to give too much load to the puck carrier. So I always say the puck carrier, like, she has to get used to solving the problem herself, right? With no help. So not to say we won't help her, but we need to start with her being on her own and not getting that external load from her teammate, right? If she can solve that problem without someone saying, you got, you got time, she can just figure it out on her own. Then she's got a really great foundation. And then we can say, okay, well, now we're going to make it even easier for you. Sally's going to tell you what side the stick's on, or she's going to tell you, you know, quick up, or she's going to tell you wheel behind or that kind of thing. So I, I like to make it a little harder first to have that tension and then release that tension by adding, you know, that, that level of communication. But absolutely, that second quick has to be scanning and looking for pressure. Uh, I think we tend to get into like five-man breakouts way too fast. Like I watch teams now doing five-man breakouts all the time or five-player breakouts. And like it's, barely October, right? And so if we can build that communication just between second quick and, and the puck retriever, then to your point, we're, we're golden. We can break that first pass or, or make that, beat that first four checker and, and we're off to the races. So no, that's a great point. And I would do it probably, if this is a practice progression, probably the second practice or the third practice, we would start to talk about the communication of second quick. Um, so this would be the last drill of not of this practice plan, but of the like skill coach part of the practice plan. So now we would put it into uh, a regroup, right? So it's still an open ice retrieval. It's identical to what we just did on the breakout, but now they're actually going to go and attack off of it, right? So the and I, I've written it here as D's and forwards, but uh, when I first do it in practice, it is not D's and forwards. It's First player, go get it. Second player, be the backpack. Figure out which way she's turning. Turn the other way or open up the other way. Get a quick little pass. Okay. And then usually I engage that puck retriever almost right away. So we're only going to do a one on o version of it for like a moment. And then very quickly, it's going to be a give and go. So the player who retrieves the puck jumps into the rush. And whether it's a two on o or a two on one with the coach giving pressure, um, that transition happens really quickly because we've already got all those reps on the more breakout version of the drill to get them thinking about how the backpack works and how to create quick support. Um, so again, this is sort of where the final teaching drill, like pure teaching drill I would do uh, in a 60 minute portion of an 80 minute practice, or if it's a 60 minute practice, uh, we might not get this far uh, depending on the level of the team. Um, but you can see here in, in sort of the notes of the variations, you know, there's, this can become five on five or five on O, oh, like if you want to real quick. Um, and obviously you can add second pucks all over the place, but the, the focus would be the retrieval, that quick little pass to the, the, the second backpack player and then speed up the ice through the neutral zone. So that brings it all together pretty well. And, um, you know, it, it hinges all entirely on that tight turn and that scanning and that quick up step up the ice. Um, so every single drill, even my little in-between drills with the figure eight is still amplifying uh, those same skills. So um, 
Kim, I, I, I want to uh, <clears throat> interject just because I'm thinking of coaches and how they approach breakout. And if you have a pregame warm-up, <clears throat> Dom, I think you had a pregame warm-up at your tur tournament. Most teams practice a dump-in five-on-zero breakout. And one thing I see them doing at, at that level is dumping the puck in and the forwards just parking, going right from the outside down to the wall as opposed to come back through the middle and then locate. So that's sort of like coming back like a backpack in a unit of five and then spacing yourself relative to the breakout. I just wanted to throw that in because when they practice breakouts, without this coming back to the middle, coming back to the home plate, and then fanning out to the available necessary spots, they're working on, it's a bad habit.